Okay, so this is more experiments in the transference of electric power. You can see that we've got the generator, measurement equipment and transmitter set up at this end. And there is the experiment itself with the transmitter and the receiver um, with a single wire conduction and load in the center. We'll come back to that in more detail later. Just on this section first of all, um, the generator we have here, the high voltage supply, um, this has been well explained before, and then we're using the 811A vacuum tube generator uh, with the high voltage bridge rectifier. Um, that is connected um, via um, an RF ammeter um, to this matching unit which is essentially a vacuum variable capacitor um, which is adjusted here and that is connected directly in parallel across the, the primary of the transmit coil which is two turns of um, copper strap. Um, the pickup that is used to um, drive the valves um, is on the back here feeds down, full, feeds into the grid um, on the valves. Um, up top here we've got the power meter which shows the input power um, coming to the high voltage transformer. We're just using one transformer of the three here. The oscilloscope, um, the yellow trace, is showing the voltage across the primary. The red trace is showing the current, uh, the anode current um, flowing through the, the, the tube, so that is also the current that's flowing through the primary. Um, and we also have uh, a Tektronix uh, counter here, a counter timer, which is showing the frequency um, output as well. It's also connected to the yellow trace. So if we just go ahead, turn on. So we can see, we're, we're inputting about around about 200 watts, um, I can adjust that very slightly. Um, that is the input power to the, to the transformer. We have a light here showing that the high tension is on. Um, we can see that there is um, a CW um, burst. Um, this is showing the, the voltage across the primary. Um, this is the current through the primary, otherwise it, obviously it's all positive because the valves are not going to conduct um, um, in the opposite direction. And we can see that the frequency that we're currently running at is 1.742 megahertz. Um, we have um, a primary currents of 500 milliamperes RF. Um, and in the experiment, I'm just going to pan the camera a little so we can see what's happening. We see that the bulbs are lit there, and that current, another RF milliameter, is showing about 110 milliamps um, at that point in the experiment. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to look at each section of the system and follow that up with taking impedance measurements of parts of the system and then all of the experiment connected together. So what we're looking at now is the part between the generator. So the generator is, is here and here is the transmit coil and in between here we have the matching unit which has a vacuum variable capacitor there that varies from around about 20 picofarads to about 1200 picofarads. Um, that is connected in parallel um, with the input to the primary coil. There are some um, other feed elements here. These are the 1B22 um, um, vacuum tubes and spark gap tubes um, along with um, uh, inputs, high voltage input capacitors on both of those. These are not actually used um, when we're using the vacuum tube generator, but these are used um, 
when we use the um, spark gap generator. So at the moment, these are removed by the circuit via the shunts on either side. And when we adjust the capacitance, we can, we can turn that right up and right down. That's fully closed and all the way is fully open. So that's currently set at 1200 peak farad. Now behind the main transmit coil, uh, we've got a, a pickup coil, which is used to drive the vacuum tube as, a, as an oscillator. So this forms part of a, uh, a coal pits oscillator um, and it picks up a little bit of the, picks off a little bit of the signal. We use that as positive feedback. That starts the valve tubes oscillating which in turn, of course, drives the, uh, through the primary circuit. Now, for the impedance measurements, we've actually got the generator disconnected. So this is the output lead um, from the um, high-tension supply, um, RF ammeter, and this is the anode connection uh, to the input to the pair of 811A vacuum tubes. So for the small signal impedance, we've disconnected the generator. Now at the back of the picture, um, we have the, that's in the far back corner, let me just adjust the camera angle. So this silver box um, in the back here is um, SDR kits uh, vector network analyzer. This is also covered um, in more detail on the website. This has been calibrated now over the range 100 kilohertz to 25 megahertz. So we've extended the plane of reference from the output here all the way down these white wires to the input to the system. We've calibrated the reference plane of the vector network ana analyzer at this point here. Let me just bring the camera back in. So at the moment, this is set up to measure small signal AC analysis. Um, and we're just gonna look at the other parts of the system first um, and then have a look at the overall impedance measurements. So now we're looking at the outputs of the transmit coil. Uh, we can see that we have a small lead at the base output of the secondary coil. Uh, we're just gonna leave that disconnected at the moment. So the first measurement that we'll do, first impedance measurement that we'll do is the input to the primary coil. Um, so in effect, we are measuring the tuning unit and we're measuring the properties of uh, just the um, transmit coil, primary and secondary together. Um, the rest of this is part of the single wire experiment. So this is a um, RF ammeter and that's connected through, this is a, a total 100 watt um, load made from four, four 25 watt pygmy lamps. The pygmy lamps are particularly good because the filament goes in a zigzag up and down and you can see small vibrations and full, small movements of those, um, of those filaments which becomes particularly interesting in Tesla's radiant matter experiments. Um, the output is connected down to the receiver and we'll just take a look at that in a moment. So the receiver coil now has got its input coming um, from the single wire um, into the base of the secondary coil. Um, and um, well, I didn't mention the transmitter, but the transmitter and receiver have got a, a neon lamp. Uh, that's an ordinary um, five watt neon mains lamp, um, UK standard. It's into a Edison screw fitting. Um, and it gives a very good indication as to the voltage tension at the top end of the secondary coil, both for the transmitter and the receiver. And when we're actually doing experiments later, that gives a good indication as to the type of mode of transmission that's taking place between the transmitter and the receiver. So on the output of the primary, um, which is here, uh, very similar um, to, the, to the transmitter. Um, it's connected to a vacuum variable capacitor for the tuning. This is a 10 kilovolt, 20 picofarad to 1,000 picofarad um, Russian style um, 
slash 4 I think um, and that is connected there is there is a, a substantial ground connection um, here that goes up and down into a ground rod which is just outside um, this the other side of this the wall and again this is this is using the very this flexible silicone um, it's almost like silicone coated um, um, fine strand wire, so there's thousands of um, wire filaments um, in this wire, um, which makes it particularly good um, for high frequency work, um, and it has a very low overall inductance um, per meter. So we also have another load on here, we've currently got 50 watts of the load um, connected, but this is another standard 100 watt four bulb arrangement, um, like we had in the single wire section, and the moment this is currently disconnected. So at the moment we just have the receiver is the coil structure with its associated tuning capacitor and we'll be looking at the differences of what happens when you connect that load later. So that's the full transmit single wire receiver um, set up, uh, grounded down to earth um, on the primary side um, and then what we're going to have a look at now um, is how the AC small signal analysis looks like on the computer as we start to connect in various parts of the system. Okay, so now we're looking at the computer screen which has got the output from the vector network analyzer. Um, this computer was connected to the BNWA. Um, I'll just show that. So that's over there in the background, the small silver box, and the rest of the experiment that we were just looking at um, is a little bit further down the bench there. Um, so coming back to the computer, this is now, so the x-axis here is 100, starts at 100 kilohertz and ends at 25 megahertz. It is actively scanning at the moment. Um, and the vertical axis, well there are two vertical axes, the blue trace is the magnitude of the impedance of Z11. So in other words that Z11 is the reflected input um, that comes from the vector network analyzer so it sends out a signal and it measures what gets reflected back um, in a one port measurement um, that we call um, S11 or in this case because it's calibrated to impedance we call it Z11. Um, so the red trace is the phase um, and on this scale the phase is 40 degrees per division um, and the magnitude of the impedance is 450 ohms a division where the bottom is 0 ohms. Um, so we're looking now at Z11 as the generator would see for the transmitter. So remember the transmitter is not connected um, to any of the rest of the experiments at the moment. The transmit core is simply connected to the vector network analyzer and the vector network analyzer is in the same position that the generator would be. So in other words, we're looking into the experiment and seeing what the generator would, would, would see in terms of in, um, the impedance of the system over this frequency band. Now the vector network analyzer is set to continuous scan. Um, it can be seen here that that's the scan progress and it simply scans to the end and then uh, starts again. So it's on continuous scanning and that allows us to see in real time what actually happens. Um, um, as we as we start. Now in order to explain what's going on here I'm going to first of all fully open the tuning capacitor um, that's the vacuum variable capacitor that's connected in parallel with the primary and then we start having a look at what we got. So I'm just going to quickly wind that open and we have a look. Okay so I've got the vacuum variable capacitor fully open now um, and there are a number of details here that we need to look at first of all so this section here where we have 
quite a small um, or much smaller um, um, peak and an associated large phase change. This is the um, resonance of the secondary coil. Um, so in other words, in the transmitter, that secondary coil, um, the, in this arrangement of coil, like a flat coil, um, air, air gapped flat coil, um, the position of the, of the phase change of the resonance um, is largely determined by the wire length. So in other words, as the wire length changes, if I were to add extensions onto the output of that, then we would see this line move. Um, now that isn't the case for all configurations of coils, but in the flat coil and the air coil like this, the wire length here um, is um, determining the position of that in frequency. Um, and I'll just show you if I actually change the tuning on the primary capacitor, that phase change is not changing. That line is not moving because the wire length in the system is not is not changing. I'm just going to open it up again. Right up. For the open. Put that in position. Okay. So we the other thing we also notice is that the in a in a perfect theoretical resonance circuit. Um, so in this situation. Um, we have got um, a secondary coil, which is in effect, it's, a, it's, um, it's an inductor. Um, if we look at it from a, from a small signal point of view, and there's a lumped element because the wavelength here um, is very much longer um, than the wire length in the coil. Um, if we look at the secondary coil, um, obviously we've got a resonance circuit there made up of its distributed capacity. Um, and obviously the inductance represented by the by the, the wire length of the coil itself, and in a ideal um, uh, parallel resonance circuit, in that respect, you would expect to see the impedance um, in the same frequency position um, as the as the phase change but we see in actual fact that they're actually misaligned and this results from uh, the series resistance which is also in the secondary wire which is in the case of this kind of coil is quite considerable um, several hundred ohms and so we end up with a resonance there that looks a bit more like for example what you would see with a with a with a crystal um, it has like uh, it has a parallel resonance and a serial resonance so there's a parallel point and there's obviously a, a serial point as well, which actually corresponds very much with the phase change. Um, so and we're going to look at that section in more detail. Now moving further up, obviously we've got harmonics of the, of the secondary. Um, so the second, second harmonic um, there, um, that will actually be the... Um, so this is the lambda by four, so it's the quarter wavelength. Um, this will be the first odd harmonic, so three lambda over four, and then that progresses upwards in frequency. And we see that those resonances are considerably smaller, and they're also reflected um, in the impedance as well. Now, this big peak that we see here is the impedance of the, of the primary circuit, because in effect, if we just look at the primary on its own, at the moment, then, and we ignore the effect of the secondary coil, the primary is in effect um, a coil, um, a two-tone coil, which is in parallel with its the vacuum tuning capacitor. Um, so it forms a parallel resonance circuit, and what we would expect from that is we would expect to see this large peak at resonance, but quite noticeably, the um, impedance peak here formed by that resonance is far away from the, the uh, in frequency from the uh, phase change. So this phase change, this transition here, um, 180 degree phase change, is almost um, 
15 megahertz away from the peak of impedance that also results from that resonant circuit. And if I was to remove the capacitor completely from the circuit, we see that that phase change has disappeared. It's actually gone further up in frequency. The impedance has moved a little bit, but the phase change has come up higher in frequency. Um, as there's now only the parasitic capacitance of the of the coil itself. So it's a it's the primary inductor, two turns of the primary inductor, and really it's resonating at a much higher frequency in terms of the phase change and for the resonance circuit um, because it's got a very tiny capacitance. It's just it's um, it's essentially just the parasitic capacitance or self capacitance of that that two turn coil. So I'll plug the vacuum variable capacitor back in to the tuning circuit and obviously that's putting a little bit of additional um, capacitive loading um, on the coil and then we see this phase change come back in at the edge at 25 megahertz. So what I'll do now is I will progressively increase the tuning capacitance, uh, the primary tuning capacitance and we're going to see how those traces change. Um, so, as I slowly increase it, we see that we're applying more and more loading. There it's, so looking at the phase change at almost 20 megahertz, around the 20 megahertz part, point, then we see it's now interacting. There it's split several times, it's interacting with... Um, one of the harmonics um, of the secondary coil. Uh, we keep increasing the loading, we're going to start to see that, that phase change progressing downwards. The parallel impedance points, the magnitude of the impedance here is also moving down. We keep increasing that. still very low capacity, only about a, a hundred puff or so. There again, it just interact, we'll just wind that back slightly. You see the phase changes there is interacting again with another of the harmonic of the secondary. So I'll just stop it there for a moment because there's an interesting property um, here where you see now that the magnitude of the impedance of the primary has moved down far enough to start to be interacting with the uh, one of the harmonic points impedance of the secondary. And we see this is where we start to get very interesting balance effects and where we get to a point where it becomes very interesting in terms of the um, the, the balance between the electric and magnetic fields of induction um, within the experiment and it's that balance um, which is very important in experiments of displacement and transference of electric power and in this case we're largely looking at transference of electric power from that is transference of power supplied by the generator through the transmitter through or however they are coupled whether it be a single wire, whether it be two wires, whether it be direct um, electromagnetic transmission, so how between the two, um, or um, in its uh, inductive, um, um, because in effect the transmitter and the receiver in this experiment are very much in the near field. Um, um, so however that transference is done, um, we're looking at how the overall experiment will go, is going to um, um, interact um, and how these electric and magnetic fields of induction couple, transfer, are balanced um, throughout the whole experiment is um, very well indicated by what's happening um, by the, from, the, from the impedance measurements here. So I've stopped it at this point. We're probably only 
only about 120, 130 um, picofarads, um, and we see that interaction there going on between the primary and the um, um, harmonic of the secondary. And it's an important point to note that when you have two resonant circuits which are have um, a coupling coefficient, which is somewhere more than more than zero, but obviously less than one, um, those two circuits do not resonate at exactly the same frequency. They they compete for the same space. Um, or this is frequency space. So what you will see is you will see um, beep frequencies arising as the as the circuits get very close to each other in terms of resonant frequency, you don't just see them merge into one big peak. You see, um, you see peak splitting. Um, so in this case, um, you can see that the that the primary impedance has moved in very close, and this this secondary um, impedance from the secondary coil has now has now really risen up as those two couple together. Um, and as I continue to um, increase them, bring it down, you see the primaries passing through that harmonic. It's leaving, it's leaving that harmonic um, there, that impedance harmonic that comes from the secondary. And this big one here of the primary is now continuing to move down, it's increasing, um, energy is falling away um, from that point, yeah the peak's so big now it's even off of the top of the graph, primary peak, so as we keep increasing primary capacitance, it's going to keep coming down, coming down, now we just get to this point where the two, the, the primary resonance that's indicated by the, the phase change points again, and of course the, the quite big parallel um, impedance, um, resonant impedance of the primary, and now we're just getting to a point where it's now starting to influence significantly the secondary. So we notice that this peak here is going to start increasing and it's going to start moving um, as well in frequency as the primary starts to load and push on, on the secondary circuit. And, but we notice that the phase change of the secondary resonance is staying the same because the wire length is not changing. So I'm going to keep, oh, keep coming down and watch this. interact okay would be about three four hundred picofarads primary loading you see that this is I'll just drop down but it's as the as it interacts I'll just wind it back slightly there this impedance is going up and down as energy is coupled between the two. Um, I'm going to keep winding it in so they start interacting strongly. Now you see the impedance, parallel impedance um, that the generator sees because of the secondary is rising up. Again. Eventually it will rise up as they come into balance. Still looking for the for the best balance point. Now the primary there. Now they reach that balance point. where the impedance um, represented by the primary and the impedance represented by the secondary um, coils 
are balanced in magnitude. The um, 180 degree phase change um, for the um, secondary coil hasn't really moved. The wire length hasn't really changed significantly. Um, and the, we see that the primary um, phase change has now come down very close um, between the two. The distance between the two is also closed um, much closer. Um, now we're about, that's around about, I would say about six, seven hundred picofarad. Um, we're going to keep coming down. No, that's not. We're going to keep coming down. And we watch as it goes out of balance again. Keep bringing it all the way down. And now, the, to such a point where the primary will start, will move through the secondary and is starting to head downwards. So this is what we're doing now. So the, this now, this is the impedance represented by the primary, um, dominated by the primary, I should say, and it's heading this direction. Now down, it's lower um, than the frequency, um, resonant frequency of the secondary. Keep winding it down, keep winding it down as it starts to move away from the secondary, and that's fully wound in. So that's now 1200 puff, 1.2 nanofarad, in parallel with the two turn primary. And this, this is where it's very interesting in, in terms of how these peaks interact. This is now predominantly dominated by the primary. You see you have that small upper um, frequency, which is actually the, the, the secondary. Um, and obviously their associated phase changes. So that shows the whole range of the tuning capacitor on the um, um, Z11 um, for um, just the transmit um, coil with its, with its primary tuning. What we're going to do next is I'm going to um, change the, 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 the scale of the, of, the, of the scan, so reduce that so we can have a much more detailed look at what's going on um, in this section. Okay, so this is now, um, everything has been um, uh, reduced, so we're now scanning between 100 kilohertz and 5 megahertz, and nothing has been changed um, in the experiment, so the capacitor, the primary tuning capacitor is now wound in fully, it's 12, about, around about 1200 picofarad. Um, and we are still connected to just the transmitter um, coil. So this is where we ended the last, last run. So as I now start to wind it out, I'm going to bring it back to a balanced point and then we look in more detail what we got here. You see that phase change from the primary about to disappear off the top of the get it to there. There's a balance between the primary and the secondary. That point there. Okay. So, so this is now showing um, a balanced point um, between the primary and secondary. Um, we've got that um, 180 degree phase change going on from the from the um, plus or minus 180 degree phase change going on from the secondary circuit in the center. And then we've got um, the effect due to um, uh, the interaction between the primary and the secondary resonance circuits here. So this is, shows very distinctly that, that peak splitting. And it leads to that property that you now actually, this coil combination, one primary resonance circuit and one secondary resonance circuit interacting coupled like this 
are now showing two possible places of resonation. So a lower frequency and an upper frequency. And what we're going to do is I'm going to use these markers here. I've got this marker. I'm going to put it at the top of the peak there. Get that on top. There. And let's just zoom in a little bit. Makes it easier to, to position. Up there. And we're going to move the second one to the top there. We'll just pause it whilst we take some readings. So those two markers are shown here and we can see that the um, that frequency there, one is 2.04 megahertz and position two is 3.18 megahertz. So there are two Depending on how you tune this, when we use the vacuum tube generator, we can make it oscillate on one position, or we can make it oscillate on the other. Um, so these will be points of resonation, and we can correspond the frequencies that we expect here with um, the frequency at which the generator is actually oscillating at. Um, and that can be accomplished simply by tuning um, the primary capacitor and of course that leads to a whole set of interesting things now so obviously when it's coupled to the receiver at the other end um, it's how that one is tuned as well um, I mean when I join them together um, in a moment and then we will see how that looks um, I've got the other so I would say probably the primary now is tuned between about 700 and 800 picofarad um, for the transmitter and for the receiver the capacitor is set at 800 picofarad um, as a balance point, as a reasonable balance point so that we have the system tuned uh, between the transmitter and the receiver. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to now reconnect um, the lead at the uh, that was disconnected at the bottom of the secondary for the transmitter, I'm going to reconnect that to the single wire. So in effect, I couple the transmitter and the receiver together, and then we see what effect that has. Okay, so I've connected that. I'm going to start the scanning again. Okay. So we've now got the transmitter and receiver connected together and we see immediately we've got another set of splitting. So we've added, we now have four resonant circuits involved here. We have the primary resonant circuit of the transmitter, the secondary resonant circuit of the transmitter, the secondary resonant circuit of the receiver and the um, primary resonant frequency of the receiver and those four are all coupled together so if I now readjust the primary transmitter I'm going to readjust the balance because connect them together has obviously changed so I'm just here increasing capacitance slightly and I'm watching these ones specifically here into balance. If I take it further they're going to start unbalancing. Just wind it up again. Okay, here we are. Just going to put it at that point. These ones are balanced. These ones are the upper resonant frequency split is not um, balanced impedance but here we see it overall um, very interesting results and the other thing is that we also saw that when because the wire length had changed then the phase chain has also changed if I just disconnect that again transmitter and the receiver we will see there this line moved up um, now reflects the wire length associated with the transmitter if I now reconnect the transmitter and receiver together this has jumped down um, 
and it's this um, that is now reflects the increased wire length um, of the transmitter and the receiver connected together. Um, and we also see there is some interaction even going on between the, the subsets within the circuit. So in other words, going on between the, the, the transmitter and the receiver and the various different resonant circuits, um, the, the four resonant circuits that make up all of those things. Uh, now, at the moment we, we are connected one side of the receiver to ground, um, so we keep everything so, uh, so it's not floating um, at the load reference at the end. Um, and I, if I connect the load, so without the load connected, the bulb load and the receiver, then we are able, the Q um, through the system is high. Um, the resonant circuits don't have a great deal of loading um, on them, and we're able to see these peaks very clearly. Now, if I connect the load, which I'll just do, I've connected the load at the primary of the receiver, and what we can see, obviously, we, we, we've considerably reduced the Q of that entire transmission path from transmitter to receiver. Um, in effect, we no longer see the, the individual oscillation of each of the resonant circuits there, but we see an, an, an amalgamated um, as the Q of the system has gone down, um, and in effect, we've put loading on the output of the um, receiver primary. So we can again um, adjust. We see that the wire length hasn't changed, so the phase change really just is, is much the same place. So now we're going to move that until we balance the two again. So we balance the magnitude of the impedance, the primary and the secondary, distributed over both coils. And now let's have a look at how those resonant frequencies have changed. Just pause the scan, and we look at the measurements. So now this resonant frequency here is 1.88 megahertz. And this one here is 3.01 megahertz. Um, and those are two stable oscillation places for um, looking at transference effects and transference phenomena um, between the transmitter coil and the receiver coil um, in this um, resonant flat coil um, uh, wireless experiment. Um, The, just to add a third marker, we add a third marker and we'll put that at the phase change at the center there, just so we can see what that frequency is as well. Oh, a little bit difficult to get at the top there. Okay, so that is at 2.33. So 2.3 there, and that is largely determined this arrangement of experiment by the wire length um, um, of the coils, and particularly because the coils are not tightly, tightly wound. Um, they are loose wound air core um, where the um, primary resonant frequency is largely determined is, um, by the wire length, and that phase change in very much reflects the um, quarter wave length um, of the wire length where the top is represents a high impedance or an open circuit that's where the neon bulb is and the impedance is low um, it's lower um, at the at the base of that coil um, so therefore can be treated in a lambda by four where of course the primary in this case is a lambda by two um, so it is a loop um, a half wave loop um, with the capacitor connected across its endpoints so overall this shows how impedance changes um, as i wind the tuning capacitor i can move it in and out of tune so i'm going to re fully close it now and we see how this whole system let me just start it scanning again okay we 
you see how this, that's 1200 puff. So balance towards the lower frequency, the stable points of um, oscillation of the system here, because we are using a feedback oscillator to drive this, is going to be at this frequency. So as I adjust this variable capacitance, I'm going to be oscillating here because it's a stronger, stronger peak and I will be adjusting the frequency of that oscillation in this range. I'm reducing the loading capacitance on the primary and I see we're going to go back to that balance point there which driven by a feedback oscillator means that we will this will be a unstable point and um, I mean it's interesting because of the way it's driven um, this is actually the balance the best balance between the electric and magnetic fields of induction across the whole system from the transmitter and the receiver but when you're driving it with a feedback oscillator then the, you're going to find instabilities so in other words it's going to flip between here and here depending on which one is slightly stronger. Um, so from the point of view of a feedback oscillator, this is an unstable drive position. If we were using a linear amplifier here, um, where the, f the output uh, frequency was fixed by the, by the exciter or the, um, whatever is driving that, be a signal generator or ham radio or whatever we're using as the, as the, as the exciter for the power stage, then we would be able to um, see that point of tune in terms of a, a single frequency and a single balance um, between the two and the point of maximum power transfer. Um, now as I continue to... Okay, now we're... I'm reducing again the loading capacitance. Let's just stop it there for a moment. And now we see here now we're going to be oscillating at this frequency. So again, with the feedback oscillator, we're going to be oscillating somewhere up around the 3, 3.1. At the upper, let's just move that, 2, so that's 3.12 megahertz. And by adjusting at this point, I can obviously adjust where it's going to oscillate in that region. It's going to be oscillating at the upper frequency of this system. Obviously, as I reduce the loading capacitance on the primary circuit of the transmitter, a lot it's going to push it right up. And around about here, up at about 4 megahertz or so, it's going to reach the limit of the setup of the 811A vacuum tube. You can get that stably oscillating up to about 4 four, four and a half megahertz. Again, you see as I adjust, no change to the phase change, central phase change, determined by the overall wire length of the transmitter and receiver connected by the single wire in between. We can see here a little bit of indication of the, of the split there, but because the Q is reduced because of the loading at the output of the receiver um, that's masked but you can see evidence there of the two peaks inter interacting the two resonance circuits interacting and also a slight indication of the of the phase change associated with that interaction between the two coils Another point of interest is equidistant impedance, so I'll estimate that as about there. And that is a point where now the, the peaks here are equidistant away from the centre point. This also represents an interesting experimental point. Um, so we have a situation where it's oscillating very strongly on this side equidistant um, impedance either side of the um, 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 overall um, wire length phase change and resonant frequency then we have balanced magnitude peaks but they're not equidistant 
and then of course we move into the section where the where the secondary um, or the upper resonant frequency dominates and again then we're operating on this side of the resonance so operating on this side operating equidistant operating balance and then operating on this side so by adjusting the tuning um, uh, capacitor and this is just as obviously adjusting the transmitter one you can also adjust um, the one on the receiver and then you can actually change the stable point of where they balance so in other words by adjusting the balance um, I can move the balance to another frequency based on adjusting both of the primary capacitors on the transmitter and receiver. So that balance will illustrate that. That's the balance point there. Now, if I go and adjust What I've done there is I've reduced the capacitance um, of the um, primary in the receiver and we see now it's unbalanced it the other way. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to adjust the, the primary of the transmitter to compensate for that. So then I retune the system back to a matched condition. I'll wind this back in. Okay. Let's put it back to about 800 puff at the receiver. Just balance that up. Just illustrates what happens when we take the, the load off of the um, the receiver primary, and then we see that splitting again. So I just remove that load again. So the Q of the system has gone up, um, and now we illustrate a more subtle. So there we balance in the lower frequency, we're balancing that interaction based upon resonance due to the secondaries of the transmitter and the receiver, and if I adjust further, I can get the balance in the upper as well, which also represents an interesting operating point. So now we're, we're balanced there, but we're not balanced here. Very tricky to get all of those simultaneously balanced. Um, I'll have a go with that. I adjusted a little bit the receiver. Either way. Okay, bounce going the wrong way there, or slightly better before, so. Adjust the transmitter tune again. That seems about the best point. So not completely balanced across all four coils, but quite close within the realm of experimental error. That would be a good balance point where the system is 
well tuned from the perspective of the generator to the load at the end. Okay, I put the load back um, at the output of the secondary and re-tune for the balance. There. Okay, I think that illustrates very well um, how the impedance measurements um, can show a lot about how to tune um, the system, where to drive it, and where the interesting points of experiment are going to be. Um, I'll just go over those one more time. So it's in a situation where we're operating in the lower part um, of, the, of the, the resonance of the system, so with the lower frequency. Um, there is then the equidistant point around the central wire length. There's the balance point in magnitude um, around the um, um, the central point and then there's the there's the larger peak in the in the upper um, resonant frequency area so there's there's um, four very distinct areas there um, to explore in terms of the experimental results and how that corresponds to the transverse of electric transference of electric power and how that also corresponds to single wire experiments and um, uh, transverse and longitudinal um, conduction modes um, so the transverse uh, mode um, and the longitudinal magnetodielectric um, mode um, which also um, occurs within this system. We'll be coming back to those experiments shortly.